On today's show, we have a friend, Sean Wong. He's an opera composer, a musician, and even a, a trainer. Born and raised in Vancouver, I grew up downtown, but pretty much grew up in Chinatown as you know, my father had businesses down here and my mom, you know, as a Chinese family, she'd do all her shopping here. And as a young Chinese kid, I'd do martial arts in, uh, in Chinatown. So I pretty much grew up here, you know, doing martial arts my whole life since I was about the age of 12 on Cordova Street. And then our classes moved to Hastings Street and whatnot. And you know, as a young kid doing lion dancing and dragon dancing and do all the fun things that Chinese kids do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess a lot, of, and also growing up in an apartment building my whole life uh, had a big influence on me as you interact with a lot of different people and you get exposed to a lot of different music at a, you know, at a young age that typically probably someone in my, in my shoes uh, wouldn't be exposed to. I didn't really start teaching myself the guitar until I was about 20, uh, pretty much right after my father died, as kind of when I took a, tr a backpacking trip across China and I went from Shanghai to Tibet, and I, out of that trip I realized that I, you know, I really wanted to, to, to learn the guitar because it's something I always wanted, because as a young kid, the two posters on my wall uh, were, were always Bruce Lee and Jimi Hendrix. And I always thought how cool if those two people were the same person. Um, my band is Son of James. We're a born and bred Vancouver rock band, I'd say, but we call our sound China Trucker Funk. And that's pretty much, we, we blend a, the southern rock soul sounds with the haunting elegant sounds of Asian Chinese instrumentation such as the Chinese arhu, which is the Chinese violin, and, and the Chinese harp, which is the guzheng. I come from a background of Chinese opera actors and performers. Uh, on my mother's side, my grandfather and his whole family were part of a Chinese opera troupe. Um, and, you know, as a kid growing up, I'd listen and observe what my grandfather was doing. Um, and I would take that I guess, uh, like through my subconscious, and then go home to my, to my apartment building, you know, and roam around my hallways, coming home from school, and you hear like Van Halen and Guns N' Roses, ACDC, all these other rock bands blasting, right? That you, I would never, I, you know, I, I didn't even know who they were, right? It's just, but I guess that was part of my growing up, is just these two different sounds just blending in my head. Um, you know, even as a young kid, I had a, I had a passion for, for drama and theatrics, right? Being done a couple plays in high school and whatnot, but nothing serious. Um, but then later on, like I said, it wasn't until when, when, my, when my father passed away, when I was 20, where I realized, you know what? This is, I'm going, I, I'm, I better go chase what I really want to do deep inside my heart before time is too late. I guess that's what it kind of teaches you is, you know, you're here today, gone tomorrow. And um, so, you know, from then on, I set up this path of, you know, teaching myself how to play the guitar, uh, meeting a lot of different people, and learning from different, a, lot of, a lot of different people. And, you know, here we are today, again, through the kindness and direction from a lot of good people. Uh, here we are today, where I've written this rock opera called Tale of the East Side Lantern, which is a story about a man named Jimmy who lives in Chinatown in one of those rundown SROs. He gets haunted by a ghost, a Chinese opera ghost. The Chinese opera ghost tells him that she's been murdered and he needs to help her find the murderer. And if he does, she's gonna give him something that he wants in return. So he does that and this sends him into wild goose chase throughout Chinatown. And while he's doing that inadvertently, he's getting a history lesson of Chinatown and inadvertently, he's learning about this whole otter eating the koi uh, story that's unfolding in real time. Yeah, so the story is, uh, you know, for s however he did it, this otter 
got into the, the garden here, the waters of the garden, and started like going on a rampage and eating all these prized koi fishes that had been there here for about 30 years. Even the oldest fish, Madonna, had been like slaughtered by, by this otter. And the funniest thing about this thing is wildlife protection, everything was all over it. And nobody could catch this thing. They, would, they, they, they laid out traps. The otter took the bait out and would beat the traps. This thing, this thing was the wily coyote. So this thing, this, this, this otter became this like, kind of this outlaw badass cult figure where now people were saying, yeah, go otter, go, go otter, go. So it became this thing where um, people were chanting, cheering for the otter because it was like, you know, because it was just like the underdog because everyone was trying to catch it. But then at the same time too, people were kind of forgetting about what the koi represents to the Chinese symbolically and what the koi represents to the gardens uh, historically. So it kind of divided the city uh, where people were picking Team Otter and Team Koi. And really, there's a lot of, you know, there was, there's a lot of undertones in that because to me, it was kind of symbolic of the way how the otter kind of represented the gentrification of Chinatown and the koi represented the history and uh, uh, the ancestry of Chinatown. And, you know, lo and behold, the, like the, the otter got away and so that happened a year ago. So during that year, uh, I've been writing this opera. And we, so for a full year, this thing had been gone. So then we performed this opera, uh, the, the, first, the first act of it, on Halloween night, October 31st. Two days later, this damn otter shows up again <laughs> and claims six more fishes. Right? This, it, it just, it's, like, it's like we summoned the otter somehow. It had been gone for a year. And two days later, after our opera, after we got all this press on the opera, covered the Georgia Strait, the, the you know, CBC, the Jewish Independent even, <laughs> we did a thing on us. Two days later, this, yeah, this, this artist came out of nowhere. You know, it was so, it was the most bizarre thing. And I, when that happened on Saturday, my phone just went off the hook. The truth is strange to fiction. Totally. <laughs> You can't know. You can't make this up. Like I said, this, an otter eating a fish should be a nothing story when you look at it on the surface, really. But this thing's turned into this real. I don't know what kind of story. It's, it's turned into this uh, story of like there's so many symbolisms in this in this thing. You know, there's so many things attached to this thing that shouldn't be attached, no. right? It's just an animal eating another animal. So I had been working on this and. Then I approached Vancouver Cantonese Opera, uh, run by Rosa Chang, because what I wanted this to be was a fusion of, of, uh, of different styles of music, you know, old Chinese theatrics versus the theatrics of today, you know, old Chinese music versus the music of today, you know, uh, a story of the otter versus the story of the, of the koi. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's a lot of... Uh, a contradicting uh, uh, storylines and and, and 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 styles that I wanted to blend together. So I contacted Rosie Chang to come on board as the Vancouver Cantonese Opera uh, to bring their style into this story. And having done that, then I brought in Vancouver Moving Theatre with uh, Terry Hunter and Savannah Walling, who you know have deep roots in Chinatown as well, and they run Heart of the City Festival. So I approached him that I said, I'm writing this story. You know, do you think Heart of the City would be interested in us becoming a part of it? And they said, yes, yeah, sure, perfect. And from that, Savannah Walling was great enough to help me like, become my drama tour for it. And really, because I, I have no writing experience. This is my first time ever doing anything like this. And I don't admit to, you know, to being any great writer at all. And like I said, because of her kindness and her, 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 her seeing the bigger picture of this the vision of this of this project, you know, she took on the role of John Mature to really pull a lot, of, a lot of this information out of me, right? And you know, she, God bless her for reading a lot of my crap. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, so from that, you know, you know, Vancouver with Vancouver Cantonese Opera bringing their Chinese opera theatrics to the table, um, Vancouver Moving Theater and Heart of the City bringing the logistics and the know-how to the table. And my band, Sonny James, being, bringing our blend of music to the table, China Trucker Funk, and adding the rock element to it. And then also, we brought in Andy Toth, a musical director, who would bring 
who, who would round it out and shape it for us. And then, you know, also great people like Charles Barber, Rick Tay, who really like went out of the way and to, to give me advice, to, to help me move this along in the right direction, to teach me about writing. Uh, a lot of things that I didn't, like when I first wrote this, uh, I remember Rick was telling me my, my writing's too expository. I didn't even know what the hell that meant, so I looked it up, <laughs> you know what I mean? So this has been a huge learning experience for me. And, um, you know, this isn't just because of me, it's just, you know, a whole lot of people brought this together. Um, you know, I learned a lot about writing. I learned about, a lot about writing. I learned a lot about drawing the audience in. Um, you know, how to, how to tell a story, like how to, how, how to keep the pace moving of the story going. Um, really, like I said, and because of that, you know, to go back to your past question, because I don't think I answered it, the, the reaction was great. People loved it. People loved seeing, you know, they didn't think they, something like this could be blended together. You know, and that's what I, I learned the most is people actually like dig this story. Because it, there's no Chinese story like this that's kind of not something that's told from the 1800s or that's like a Miss Saigon or, you know, there's nothing current today that, that resonates with people like me. You know what I mean? Because I'm a person who's, you know, although I'm, I'm Chinese and I love being Chinese, I'm, I'm, but it's obvious I'm a Chinese Canadian. The biggest hurdle was writing, was getting the story. You know, I, I, people, I think, always liked the idea, but it was always, what, what, what was this, what, what, what story, what's the story that's r really gonna tie it all together? And pff, that goddamn otter came, you know what I mean? That, that story really is the through line to this, that's because that was the missing piece to this whole story was that otter and the koi, because there's so much symbolism in those two characters of the otter and the koi that represent so much um, and it was just that thing that attached uh, everything. It was everything. It was it was the thing that tied everything to get together. Because we have a ghost from the past that's you know completely Chinese and and, and traditional. That's the koi. You know we have a character named Jimmy, who is from today's world, living in a Chinatown of today that's being you know kind of gentrified in a way. And now all of a sudden became the otter. And so from those two, Koi and the otter, like it just gave us like a glue that we just didn't have before. Oh yeah, because it, it, keep in mind, that was a one-off, but only half the story and only a workshop presentation. So the next step, because the feedback was so great, people loved it, people loved the music. You know, obviously being our first time, we got to clean things up, but the next step is to, to, fit, to do the whole story and to get into full production, right? Meaning set designs and props and wardrobe and lighting design, the whole works, right? This is kind of done bare bones just with the band, the story and some actors. Queen E. Yeah, I think Queen E. You know, even, actually I would love to play Norfium, but I don't know if they like, if they do shows like that, Norfium, do they? Where they have actors. I don't think I've never seen one. Oh, you know, actually, you know, I take that back. What I really would want to see it. I, I, I've always wanted to do, and I've talked to people about this. I want to shut down Chinatown, and shut down Pender Street. I want to do a huge street party, put a big stage on Pender, and I want to perform it live in Chinatown. You know, outdoors, like throw a big party here in, in Chinatown. Hey, if City Council, Chinatown House. I'm coming for you guys. All right, so I'm, I'm going to keep knocking. You know, we can do this the hard way or the easy way. You choose. If you love something, love it to death, you know, love it to death and don't give up on it. No one knows you've been hitting this thing oh, the 99 times, they only see the 100th hit. Big shot for being on the show. Uh, this is, that's actually, it's coming full circle. Uh, we met you on uh, Italian Days two years ago, two or three years ago on our very first episode. Our, first show, yeah. our very first show. Is that right? That was your first show? That was our first show. No way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, all his links will be in the description below, and we'll see you next time. Hey, what's your story, Vancouver? Peace.